um, <laughs> I must admit, as I was sort of sitting there during um, our prayer, our time of prayer and our Bible ring, um, started getting these little butterflies uh, in my stomach. It's been a while since I've been able to preach the Word of God. Obviously, I um, didn't do it in December. Um, so I think, yeah, having, uh, yeah, been a long time uh, since doing this, I think I felt uh, this slight nervousness, um, yeah, in uh, delivering this word uh, this morning. And I say all of this because I think every January, um, it is quite a challenging time uh, when it comes to uh, sermon preparations and when it comes to preaching. And it is because it's the beginning of the year. It's the beginning of the year, and it is a great opportunity to think about the year ahead and share a message that can carry us throughout the year. And there is so, as well as a bit of nervousness and a bit of excitement, there's also some pressure, you know, to get these messages right. Pick the right theme. Think of the right theme. Think about the right message that can really add to all of us as God's people and edify us as a church. And it was when I was, I suppose, feeling that slight pressure and that worry, thinking, oh, am I uh, thinking about the right themes to talk about, that I had the opportunity to read again the Beatitudes, the words of blessing. And the reason I wanted to preach on this over the next three weeks is because I want all of us to remember what Jesus said is the blessed Christian character. I want us to remember and hold fast to the truth of what it truly means to be blessed. What is the mark of of our Christian faith and of the Christian life. I believe the rise of the internet and having instant information has left many of us somewhat confused. You can say that this is especially the case for younger people with their smartphones and hopping on social media, every opportunity that they get, myself included, Um, But it is not exclusive to younger people. There's so much information out there. There's so much utterance of ideologies, whether it is in politics, you know, the conservatives versus the liberal, you know, Israel versus Palestine, whether it's social, you know, feminism versus the red pill, pro-choice versus pro-life. Even in the religious realm as well, whether we're debating about different religions like Christianity, Islam, or even within our church, we've got the Reformed, the Arminians, the Progressives, all sorts of information that we have at our fingertips. What do we trust? What do we listen to? On what information as our foundation do we build our lives? Many of us can fall into the trap of building our thoughts, our values, and our character based on what we hear on the internet. But I want to share with you this this morning. Peter said that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He has called you out of darkness to be his own possession has brought you into this marvellous light. And so we read Paul saying that we are blessed, that that God our Father has poured every spiritual blessing in heaven for our sake. But he hasn't just only blessed us in the past. What we learn today is that he blesses us now. 
And what we also realize in Scripture is that He will continue to bless us till the end time. And so when we think about how we build our lives, you know, what our thoughts are, what our values are, what character we should be upholding, we are to look nowhere else. No matter how good the intentions these informations are, no matter how much we might agree with these informations, we are to look nowhere else but to Jesus and what he has said. And when we look to Jesus... We heed his sermon. We heed his teaching. We find comfort in it, knowing that it is complete. And we find our ultimate security and fulfillment in him. That is my prayer for you. And that is why I want to look at the Beatitudes over the next three weeks. So that we will continue to walk in the light and be blessed by our marvelous Lord who has given his life for us, who has given us every spiritual blessing to those who do not deserve a smidge. So let's have a look at the Beatitudes over the next couple of weeks. And before we go into the individual uh, blessings of Jesus, I want us to quickly just have an overview of the Beatitudes. Just a couple of points, because I want us to see the beauty of this teaching, just how incredible this teaching is. But I also want our sermons over the next couple of weeks to really be framed in these three points. And after we go through these three points, we'll have a look at the first two blessings of Jesus, the poor in spirit and to those who mourn. So the first thing I want us to recognize is that the Beatitudes was the first sermon that was recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Why is this significant, you might ask? Well, this is significant because when we see the continuation of the Bible, the Old Testament ends with judgment from God on his people, for his nation has sinned greatly. And we know that before Jesus came, because of this great judgment, there was four centuries of silence. After those four centuries of silence, now the sun, in the days of Matthew, the sun had come. And we see in John's gospel that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world to bring further judgment, to to drive the nail into the coffin. No, he said he came in order that the world might be saved through him. He came so that he would be a blessing to the church. So that's why it is so significant. In an Old Testament that ended with God's judgment, when Jesus came, his very first words are words of blessing. Second, Jesus' blessings, as I mentioned before, is not a past reality. It's not a future reality. It is something that he gives now. It is something that he gives today. Professor Randolph Tasker says this, when we read the Beatitudes, the future tense of each blessing, they emphasize, we have to understand this, the certainty of, of these blessings. He emphasizes the certainty of these blessings, not the futurity of these blessings. So he's not talking about blessings that is only to come in the future. No, he's talking about blessings that we receive now that will certainly find its fulfillment when Jesus returns. So Jesus talks about the certainty of his blessings. And I want us to think about this for a moment because last week, Barry concluded our Advent series looking at the return of Jesus. And the one thing that really stuck to me from last week's sermon is the concept of waiting. I wonder if that sort of stuck with you as well. While we wait, what do we do? 
Well, we see in Acts that the apostles, they just gazed up into the, into the sky as they saw the risen Jesus go up to the Father. Just, just stared, waiting for something to happen. In so many ways, we can live our lives exactly the same way, just gazing pointlessly with inactivity. But we see our waiting is not pointless, it's not aimless, and it's not with inactivity. But we wait with purpose and with great expectation. And one of the reasons why we do that is because of this reality that blessings is not just for when he returns in the future, for us just to gaze into the sky, hoping one day that Jesus will come down on the clouds. No, the blessings that he gives is for the now. It's for today. So that we do not sit around and do nothing. So as we listen to the Beatitudes over the next couple of weeks, let's receive these blessings. So that as we live our lives, we live with purpose. We live in the aim to glorify our Lord Jesus, who has given everything for us. Finally, so we looked at, we looked at the, the first words of Jesus. We looked at the blessings that are here for the now. Finally, I want us to recognize just how simple the Beatitudes are. How simple they are, yet so how profound they are. If you look at it, not many words were spoken. But each word and each sentence and each proclamation held so much depth and meaning. Each individual blessing you know, is, is perfect on its own. Each blessing also works with one another. They're perfect on their own. They work with one another. Charles Spurgeon said this, they spring out of each other. It is as if each beatitude depended upon all that went before it. Each growth feeds a higher growth. So what we recognize here is as simple as they are, they're not just random statements that he just plucked from different concepts and ideas. No, Jesus has said things in a strategic way so that each blessing that he gives, it springs out from one another. It depends on one another. And I hope you'll be able to see that as we look at our individual blessings throughout the next three weeks. As we move on from the poor in spirit to mourning, to the meek, to the hunger, or to the hungry and the thirsty, and so on and so on. As we go down this list, that we'll just see how it all works together and find what it truly means to be blessed in the name of our Lord Jesus. But it is also so profound, and this is going to lead into our first verse this week. What interests me about each blessing is that they are a paradox. They are a paradox. As a result, John Stott said that Jesus contradicted all human judgment and all nationalistic expectations of the kingdom of God. And this is not just relevant for the time of Jesus it also contradicts. Jesus' sermon contradicts the expectations and ideas of the Western culture today about how we find happiness, who is blessed, and who is deserving to be in the kingdom. Or in sort of layman's terms, or what we understand, who gets to enter heaven? Is it everyone? Is God only loving if he lets everyone in, no matter how sinful our lives are? Or is there something else to it? What does Jesus say on this matter? And I'll find, I think we'll find what Jesus says contradicts every expectation this world has. 
And so as we think about these three things, I want us to see that Jesus, he doesn't wait to really bring out the clearest example of this paradox. And let's have a look at our first teaching this morning. In verses 1 to 3, it says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus set himself to get ready to preach, I almost wonder, I wonder if these things are just flowing through his head. Was he thinking about an introduction or was he just going to go straight into his message? He set himself. And as the crowd also gathered to be ready to hear the words, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What incredible words. For the first hearers of Jesus' sermon, their only spiritual examples were the religious leaders who showed the complete opposite of being poor in spirit. They rather showed off their their supposed richness in the spirit boasting about their circumcision, boasting about their family line, their their righteousness, their zeal for the cause, and, you know, their position of leadership and the amount of authority that they have gained whilst judging everyone who is poor. This was the spiritual example of the time. These were the people who were supposedly representing our God. They were the face of blessedness. They were the face of who receives the kingdom of God. But with one sentence, how Jesus just shattered that reality. Completely shattered the evilness of the religious leaders at the time. Because blessing has nothing to do with achievements or externally praiseworthy qualities. To be blessed by Jesus, it has nothing to do with your achievements and your externally praiseworthy qualities. And just as that was true when Jesus sat down on the mount to say these words, it is very true today. So just thinking about this, friends, let's not fall victim to the idea that we can offer something to God. Because I served here, Lord. Look at my magnificent service. Lord, I've been to church since I was in my mother's room. I've been to church literally my whole life. Lord, look at the offerings that I bring. Look at the offerings that I've given every single Sunday. Lord, I don't have a necklace around me, but look... I've got a necklace of a cross. I had you following around me all this time. Look, I had my ring jewelry that's got a cross on it. I'm worthy of your acceptance. I've earned my merits. We are not to fall into this trap that we of thinking that we can bring an offering to God in case that we trick ourselves into thinking that we are better than what we truly are. As Jesus is clear this morning, that true Christian character isn't about your achievements, about what you have and what you have done, but true Christian character 
is being poor in spirit. So what does this mean, poor in spirit? When we think about the poor, what do we think about? We may often think about poor being or having severe lack of resources, and that could be food, it could be water, it could be education, maybe even just general resources today like toys and necessary goods. Or maybe we can even think about, um, yeah, sort of other countries where they're less fortunate. But what we learn in the Old Testament is that to be poor was essentially to be reduced to absolutely nothing. It is actually hitting rock bottom to the point of great humiliation. It is being unable to save yourself. And in your humility, in fact, needing a saviour. It's needing someone to save you. I think we can see the connection there, can't we? Of why true Christian character is to acknowledge our spiritual poverty. Because true Christian character is to acknowledge that we are not righteous. For Paul said to the Romans that no one is righteous, no, not one. But we are sinners needing a saviour. Because there's no amount of credit that we can stack up for ourselves that makes us worthy in the eyes of the Lord. So our spiritual poverty is to hit rock bottom and acknowledging, Lord, we need you. And to, in fact, go to Jesus who said, come to me and I will give you you rest and confess our sins to him that we bow down and fall to our knees and say to him indeed lord i am a sinner have mercy on me that is the christian character not of what we have but it's about what we don't have And that is why we sang this morning. I wanted to point out verse 3 in the hymn, Rock of Ages. Because in fact, we have nothing in our hands that we bring. Therefore, our only option and the only way to be right with God is to simply cling and never let go of the cross. For all of you who have had children, you've had your child, hang on to your legs. I don't know about you, our little one, you try to shake her off. And surprisingly, somehow she she stays there. I, I don't know how that works, but she's able to cling on so tight that even if I give her a shake, she's still there. She doesn't let go. That is how we are to cling to the cross in our spiritual poverty, in our emptiness, in our bankruptness, if that's a word, bankruptcy. When we have nothing, our only refuge is our Lord Jesus Christ who has emptied himself for us. And so I love this expression from R.C. Sproul, where he says, to be poor in spirit in biblical terms means that someone has a poverty of arrogance. Because any idea of thinking we can offer something to God that buys our merit, or buys our salvation, even if it's just the littlest idea, It's pride and arrogance. And I see Sproul is clear that to be poor in spirit is to empty ourselves of that arrogance. And in doing so, 
in his marvelous and matchless grace. He blesses the poor by giving himself to us and giving us his kingdom. And again, is this blessing something that we know is a future reality? When the new heavens and earth comes down, that's what we're waiting for? In one side, yes. But he's also given us his blessing now, hasn't he? He has given us his death on the cross. He has imputed his righteousness on us. And he's imputed our sins on himself when he died on the cross. He has given us the Holy Spirit. We remember the disciples who were just gazing into the sky. And they're probably gazing there until something happened. Something did happen. The promise that Jesus gave that he will send his Holy Spirit, he certainly did. But it's not just for the disciples, not just for the apostles. For all of us, he has given us his Holy Spirit to shape our lives to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. He has given us joy and peace that goes beyond all understanding. Joy and peace that doesn't depend on the presence or the absence of sadness and worry. We have all of this now. I hope you'll believe it. I hope you say amen. Because when he returns, we await the wonderful promise that he will wipe away our tears and give the new Jerusalem for us to live with him in the perfect creation, the restored creation that he first, when he created the world, said was good. Praise be to God that he would look on sinners like us and be pleased to give his life so that we might have it. The second blessing that we see this morning, which is just as much incredible as the first. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I don't know about you, but the character of mourning, it feels perhaps even slightly more intense than the first character. We remember what I mentioned before. All these characters, these blessings, they work together. They're not just individual things. So we see there's an increasing in intensity. Mourning. And when we think about mourning, we picture a funeral, don't we? We picture a funeral. We picture a hospital bed with the next of kin with those who are close to the patient, wondering if they're going to awaken again, whether they're going to be out of a coma, whether they're going to be able to get up again. Mourning is associated with sadness and with grief, with frustration and anger. We see it as a condition that we need to get over not something for us to hold on to. So when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, what good could possibly come from the character of mourning that Jesus should bless it? Well, to help us, I think John Stott actually describes this in a brilliant way. He says that this sorrow, it is not a sorrow of bereavement, It's not a sorrow of bereavement. It's not a sorrow about what you've lost, about a certain death of a relative. But what Jesus is talking about here is the sorrow and the mourning of repentance. Our sorrow comes because now, as we've read in Peter's letter, we belong to God. He has called us as his royal possession. 
He has called us to have everything to do with Jesus and nothing to do with sin. To love what he loves and hate what he hates. We read in Romans that Paul says, I abhor what is evil. Or he says, abhor, in fact, what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. And so being children of God, it is natural. I'm not going to say it can be natural, it should be natural. No, as children of God, it is natural that when we see activity of sin or the absence of righteousness and holiness and godly character, whether it is in this world, whether it's in the life of others as brothers and sisters in Christ, or whether it's in our own lives, and more importantly here, when we look at our own lives, it should bring a strong reaction out of us, even to the point of deep sorrow and mourning. The reaction should be something like Ezra, when he saw the sin of Israel and just how deeply they have fallen into disobedience. It says that Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. A very great assembly of men also came with men, with women and children, gathered to him, and they wept bitterly also. Our reaction should be like with Paul, when he says, So I find it to be a law. That when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God my, in my inner being. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul says, when I want to do evil or what I should do, I don't do what I don't do. I tend to do. When I should be avoiding evil, for some reason I, I go to evil. When I should be doing good, I avoid doing good. How wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Is this the same heart that you have? Or do you think weeping and crying and Mourning like that is just for crazy people. Do you delight in God, his person, his word, and his laws? So much so that you hate sin that offends him and disgraces him. So that whenever you see unrepentant sin happening all over and over and over again that you just drop to your knees in bitterness and in anguish and in mourning of the wretchedness of our hearts that even though we have received the grace of our Lord Jesus we continue to live disobediently to him. Or are we just so conditioned that we just look at sin and we just pass it off as if it's a joke? Have we been so conditioned by sin that every time we see anything, we're just like, hmm. Make a joke out of it. Laugh as, as if it's nothing that matters. If you indeed do delight in God and you mourn for the sin that continues to play a part in your life, I want you to hear this blessing from God. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That is guaranteed. You can be sure that your anguish and your frustration and your bitterness 
that sin is still a part of this world will be heard, that you will be comforted. King David recognized this. And it's through his psalm that we're going to conclude our service this morning. Because he recognized this comfort. And my hope is that you will find it also. He says in Psalm 55, But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and, and moan, and he hears my voice. This is in a time where that King David was in great anguish. He says in this psalm earlier that he was restless. He was complaining. He was moaning, grumbling. You see, his son Absalom had rebelled against God and his very own father, King David. As the ruler of the nation, he saw that his people had fallen away. And they continue to fall away. As a man of God, as a king of Israel, what was he supposed to do? Matthew Henry said this, horror overwhelmed him. Probably the remembrance of his sin. So in the midst of all this, the remembrance of his own sin also in the matter of Uriah added much to this terror. So we see here it's not just about what's happening to other people. In the midst of all this, the recognition of his very own sinful nature added to the terror. And when under a guilty conscience, we must mourn in our complaint. And even strong believers have for a time, have for a time been filled with horror. But none ever was so overwhelmed as the holy Jesus when it pleased the Lord to put him to grief and to make his soul an offering for our sins. And there is our great comforter, our Lord who was stricken and in grief. But it pleased him to give his life for our sins so that we might be saved, so that we may be comforted. And so for our God who gave his life, how much more will he comfort you when we cast our cares to him? So I pray that you'll be encouraged by what David says. Cast your burdens to the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous hand to be So let's come to Jesus, mourn to him of our depravity, for it is only in him that we find comfort. So you would have recognised at the top that I have titled this sermon this morning, The Beatitudes, The Helpless. And I titled it this way because I I felt the first two blessings from Jesus tells us that the blessed Christian character isn't actually to help ourselves or having the ability to help ourselves. It is, in fact, acknowledging our helplessness against sin. Because when we acknowledge our spiritual poverty and continue to give our confessions of sins to him, we can be sure of this, that he is our saviour, he saved us and sustains us. But when we don't give our lives to him, when we don't acknowledge our spiritual poverty, when we just laugh it off now, when we just fill our tummies now, storing up treasures of this earth here and now, which all may seem like blessings for now, what we will realise soon enough is that it will all be lost. If 
finding blessings anywhere apart from Jesus will be in vain. It will be lost. So may you be encouraged to look to him and to confess that Christ is all I have. Because God will surely bless you. He has blessed you in the time of Jesus when he sent his one and only son to be the, to be the propitiation of your sin. He blesses you now and he will bless you for all eternity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we indeed give you thanks that even though we have gone wandering and searching for blessings elsewhere, and I might add also in vain, that you did not just leave any of us to continue down down the spiral to our own demise. But rather, you have called us to yourself, to be your people, to be your children, to be heirs with Christ, to give us every spiritual blessing there is in heaven. We acknowledge that so many times, even though we know this and we have received this, that we at times can just go off wandering again and again and again, almost like prodigal son on repeat. So as we look to the blessings of Jesus, we pray that we will not shape our lives in the ways of this world what might just seem good for the here and now, what might temporarily seem like it's comforting and gives us security and happiness, but help us to see the blessings that we know is the eternal blessings here and now and for all eternity. For Help us to hold on to the gift that we know that once we receive can never be taken away from us cannot be snatched away from us. And we pray, as we look at this, we just recognise our own depravity, our spiritual poverty, just how unmerited we are. And look to Christ and sing hallelujah, all I have is Christ. We pray all of this in your precious name. Amen.